फाइव फोर थ्री टू वन जीरो गुड मॉर्निंग आई एम राहुल चौबे फ्रॉम फिजियो टीवी एंड संचित हॉस्पिटल फॉर टू डेज लाइव वेबिनार ऑन इंट्रोडक्शन टू वेस्टबुलर टेली हेल्थ द स्पीकर इज डॉक्टर रितु छाबरिया एंड द मॉडरेटर इज डॉक्टर दिशा आई विल रिक्वेस्ट डॉक्टर दिशा टू इंट्रोड्यूस डॉक्टर रितु छाबरिया ओवर टू यू डॉक्टर दिशा थैंक यू राउंड सर good morning and a very warm welcome to all the physio tv viewers the topic for today's session is introduction to vestibular tele health studies have stated that tele rehab has the potential to improve patient's quality of life looking at the current situation in pandemic tele rehab is a promising way to indulge patient in self management and improve their functional outcome keeping up with the recent advances considering this as an opportunity to continue rehab within the patient's own social and vocational environment this may lead to greater functional benefits for the patient moving forward we would like to know more about how vestibular telehealth actually works uh, with this brief introduction to the topic i would like to welcome and introduce today's speaker dr ritu chhabria pt she has done dpt mspt ocs cmp and certification in vestibular rehab She has received her bachelor's degree from Sancheti College of Physiotherapy in 2006 and subsequently worked in a multi-speciality hospital in Mumbai. In 2009, she completed her master's in orthopedic physical therapy (MSPT) from Massachusetts General Hospital Institute of Health Professionals. She was awarded the Institutional Merit Scholarship Award and the Mercury Ayunta Award for clinical excellence in post-professional PT. She has published research articles one one of which was conducted on physical therapy in patients with rheumatoid arthritis which was published in American Physical Therapy Association's Physical Therapy Journal in January 2011 She completed her doctor of physical therapy program from MGH Institute of Health Professional Boston in 2011 She has completed a certificate in vestibular rehab at Emory University Atlanta in 2018 and advanced course by APTA in 2020 she currently works as operations manager and physical therapist with agile physical therapy and one medical at google without delaying any further i would like to hand over to dr ritu ma'am to guide us ahead thank you thank you so much dr disha patni um i'm going to go ahead and share my screen tell me if you don't see my slides it's visible now perfect thank you um i want to say that the, i take extreme pleasure to present introduction to telehealth which is one of the first uh, ever thoughts we at agile physical therapy have developed like a course Uh, a little bit about me um i am a proud sancheti graduate and uh, mass general graduate and uh, sancheti mass general emory agile these institutions are very very close to my heart and i'm extremely thankful uh, i am what i am due to these places and they are fabulous places so um highly recommend to those who are looking for way to get educated from <laughs> uh and i have a linkedin profile so if you want to learn more about this course please add me um this year has been quite a bit right like this is kind of fun fact if it is fun at all um 390 days of lockdown or work from home we really did not know when uh almost more than a year ago when we were suddenly all in our homes um trying to figure out virtual care uh, honestly a lot of us didn't even know how to do it uh, however the culture of virtual practice telemedicine which has been going on for several years took an accelerated leap during this uh, covid-19 era so this was a executive summary of american physical therapy association of what is this, what has the covid-19 um what is the impact of covid-19 on physical therapy profession so yes there has been fewer customers decrease in physician referrals 
decrease um, in revenue in certain clinics. However, it was really interesting and encouraging to see that the career pride have increased in spite of coronavirus in physical therapists. And telehealth adoption is the silver lining to it. Insurance companies, at least in the United States, um, and to some extent even in India, are agreeing to pay um, for telehealth services rendered during this period, which was not a, not a case prior to this. And so why not continue this? Um, during this past year, our team at Agile, which consists of orthopedic physical therapists, neurophysical therapists, um, coming to, came together and uh, considered this as a passion project on how to con continue provide high quality care, which is evidence-based uh, for patients with vestibular condition while we were all working from home. And I, this quote is very close to my heart. Uh, if you can dream it, you can do it. And we did it. Agile physical therapy team developed first ever vestibular uh, telehealth competency course. So I'm gonna go and kinda show you all a little bit about this course. This course is 109 lessons. We go over anatomy, physiology, pathophysiology. We describe each and every vestibular, common, vestibular condition commonly seen as a reason of dizziness. We describe deep dive into telehealth portion of it on how to prepare a visit. Then we go into subjective. We go into if any of the flags, which I'm gonna to cover today are positive, how to refer them and where to refer them. Videos of every telehealth test um, and demonstrations, how to screen acute vertigo and not misdiagnose a central vertigo, how to see patients with concussion, how to do various balance exam, uh, examinations and video demonstrations of every single test, along with telehealth pearls of balance exam. And of course, bread and butter, BPPV, we have that as well, along with evaluation and treatment. We also covered cervicogenic dizziness because we have seen an uptick in that as well. We have developed patient logs for you to collect information from your patients in an organized manner. We have patient education handouts and putting all of that together, we have about six case studies for you to watch and understand how to, from start to end, how to conduct this successfully. And then we have an exam. So let's sneak into the course a little bit. I'll be covering a little bit of anatomy and physio, uh, physiology overview, talk about effectiveness of vestibular rehab therapy, key components of telehealth, how to prepare for telehealth and giving you all some resources. This is gonna be our journey. Hope you're prepared. All right, let's go with um, what comprises of vestibular system. We know there's a peripheral vestibular system, which is inside your ear embedded inside your inner ear. And then there is central vestibular system. These are the pathways for central vestibular system. I'll let you read it. Let's deep dive and go a little bit into peripheral vestibular system. We've blown that up in the next slide. We have three semicircular canals, which are about 90 degrees with respect to each other, not always, which is why not all BPPV cases respond in a similar manner. Um, along with there is a, there are otolith organs in the center, which are connected through vestibular nerve. We have cochlea responsible for hearing and the information is going through auditory nerve. Let's deep dive a little bit into the ampulla, which is this uh, swollen portion of the canal. Inside the ampulla, if you deep dive a little bit or zoom in a little bit more, there is cupola, which acts like a door that deflects whenever there is fluid or when you turn your head to either side, that cupola deflects. Whenever that cupola deflects, that information through hair cell is conducted through the vestibular nerve going up to the central vestibular system. In the utricle and the saccule, in the center, uh, we have 
photoconia that are calcium carbonate crystals that are present in the center. Usually for some reason, it could be a you know, stress, it could be a hit to the head. These otoconia get dislodged into the canal and that's your BPPB. Little deep dive into um, what do you see when the cupola deflects and the hair cells move? You basically see a vestibular ocular reflex. What is vestibular ocular reflex? You basically you're able to maintain a stable vision while you're turning your head. Little physiology, like I said, when you turn your head to the left, the endolymph, endolymph inside the vestibule, uh, inside the semicircular canal goes to the right. Cupola deflects. That information is taken through the hair cells, through the to the vestibular nuclei, all the way to the oculomotor pathways, to the eye muscles, and you move in a respective fashion. Other reflexes are vestibular spinal, vestibular colic. Cervical ocular, cervical spinal, and I'll let you read them. Let's cover a little bit about pathophysiology. When things don't go right, we see our patients complaining or we hear them complaining, they are dizzy. And it's important to understand what do they actually mean. So uh, Bischoff, Bischoff in 2009 actually operationally defined each of these. Um, what is vertigo? What is unsteadiness? What is lightheadedness? And there could be combinations of this. So it's very important to actually have the patient describe what they are feeling. When did the symptoms start? Do they get worse with visual motion or head motion? Or they get worse with just sitting and not moving? That is spontaneous. Is there any hearing involvement or recent hearing loss? The other thing what you want to see during an objective exam, which can be done easily by telehealth, is look for nystagmus. Nystagmus is involuntary rhythmic oscillation of eye. Basically, there is a fast phase and then there is a slow phase. So there is a fast phase and there is a slow phase. Um, and you always name nystagmus in the direction of fast component. And so look at this uh, video in right now, which was playing and I'm gonna play it. Um, if you notice, and the video says it also, uh, that this patient is having right beating nystagmus with the fast phase going to the right and then suddenly it switches and becomes a left beating nystagmus. And we'll talk a little bit more about the types of nystagmus in the next slide. There you go. So if you have eyeballs moving up or down, that's most likely a central vertigo. Central pathways are affected, not peripheral vestibular system. Um, there might be pendular vertigo, uh, pendular nystagmus, which can be confusing, and then torsional. Uh, Again, if you just see pure torsional where the eyeballs are just moving in a circular fashion, that can also be a central sign. We will not um, consider this as the only component or the only sign when we are looking at a case. We're gonna to listen to the history, we'll do a full deep dive, subjective exam, objective exam. And this is something that you sh this should strike in your head when you see these things. How will a patient with peripheral uh, vestibular system disorder respond, uh, present, and how will a patient with central vestibular disorder present? Peripheral patient will actually tell you the whole story. They remember every bit of it, so you will get a lot of details. Central patient, they will say sudden onset lightheadedness, vertigo, or imbalance with one of the Ds, which is dysarthria, dysphagia, all those red flags. Typically, this is a true vertigo at onset in peripheral. In central, this is slow onset, uh, maybe presenting more as an imbalance. Paroxysmal spontaneous events. So these uh, peripheral vertigo usually will last under 24 hours, whereas the central may last longer. So that's like the first question to ask, which can be luckily done, the history taking can be done 
uh, by telehealth very efficiently. How long are the symptoms lasting? Under two minutes, longer than two minutes. Um, and most likely to have an audit to the right or left, it will not flip, it won't change directions like the video we saw, that was direction changing nystagmus. There will be abnormalities in the VOR, that is vestibular ocular reflex in peripheral cases. In central, that's usually not affected. Nystagmus is more likely to be seen with fixation remove. What does that mean? So nystagmus is most likely seen when um, you are not in room light. Basically, there is no light and that's when you can actually see it. So we have specialized goggles in the clinic that actually record this. However, during telehealth, I've, I've had patients just close their eyes and then you can see how the eyeball moves. Um, and that's just one trick to see if you can remove fixation. Whereas for, uh, whereas for central room light, you could see everything. Fixation doesn't matter. And then saccad central exam, like saccades and sm smooth pursue is normal in peripheral, but is abnormal in central. Okay. Um, that was like brief overview of central and peripheral signs and symptoms um, when you're doing a vestibular evaluation. And the big question is, is vestibular rehab effective? Let's look at the research. This was a randomized control uh, trial done in 2019 where 330, uh, 322 participants with chronic vestibular syndrome aged more than 50 um, were divided into three groups. There was standalone rehab where they saw pre-programmed vestibular uh, exercises and practiced them along with seeing a general practitioner. The other group was just seeing a general practitioner and the third group had general practitioner, some face-to-face -face visits for cognitive behavioral therapy, as well as um, some pre-programmed vestibular exercises. And their outcome measure was vertigo symptom scale. Okay, And it was exciting to see that patients who underwent pre-programmed vestibular rehab did better than people who don't even get that opportunity. And so one of the explanations of this could be that maybe they, they, it is really hard to find a vestibular therapist, but telehealth solves that. Telehealth actually um, enables patients to see vestibular PT um, from the comfort of their homes. Let's look at even more old school, booklet-based vestibular rehab. Um, this was again a single blind, Peril group pragmatic randomized control trial in 2012, where they were looking at clinical and cost effective um, clinical and cost effectiveness of vestibular rehab, and uh, the conclusion is yes, it's simple, it's cost effective, and basically patients felt better in primary care. Let's look at systematic review. Um, this was a recent one, 2021 systematic review for patients with concussion. And uh, I really like this table from that article. So I posted it. It was very exciting to see that all this can be done by telehealth for a patient with concussion, except imaging. Okay. And I even, even argue some of vestibular therapy I've been doing by telehealth. Um, so it's really exciting to see emerging literature coming um, now, talking about what all can you do just remotely. And this was their conclusion that despite the limited original research on the use of telehealth for concussion care, the articles provide a foundation for exploring the potential value of telehealth. Telehealth may expand the ability of sports medicine physician slash physiotherapist to provide timely and effective concussion care to athletes during COVID-19 and beyond. All right, let's put our clinician hats on. Thinking as a clinician, has it been effective to conduct a telehealth visit in clinical practice? Like this is emerging literature, so not, not yet really there. 
Yes. So we have been conducting telehealth for the past year, uh, and we have measured outcomes. You know, we have measured our effectiveness. We've done the routine DHI, ABC, and all those outcome measures. One of the things that a simple question that we have asked our patients is how likely is it for you to recommend brand to a friend or a colleague by brand you could just put physical therapy or vestibular physical therapy i just wanted to define what is net promoter score and it is exciting that there has been no change in the way our patients are reporting our numbers are 10 on 10 and this is based on a sample size of about 54 patients in the past year which is growing number this was a month ago we know that Patients who are dizzy, they pay a lot of money to get a diagnosis, <laughs> okay? So, and approximately about $2,000 in the States to arrive to a diagnosis of BPPV, and uh, more than 65% will undergo potentially unnecessary diagnostic testing and therapeutic interventions. The other common cases are vestibular migraine and vestibular neuritis. Again, costing a lot of money. And during this COVID-19 period, CDC recommended the use of telehealth to minimize transmission um, of the virus to healthcare professionals, which was exciting. And there has been policy changes to reduce barriers to telehealth access. And um, there have been platforms now that we can do this successfully um, without you know, worrying about the cost. Actually, some insurances uh, in the States cover 100% for their telehealth, which is super exciting. It's much cheaper than what a patient would pay when they're coming in the clinic. So if a clinician was trained on how to evaluate a patient with acute vertigo or dizziness and successfully triage this person um, to the right professional, you can decrease their medical bill and improve their satisfaction overall and the trust in the healthcare system and trust in our profession. Um, so that's really dear to me. Little deep dive into the vestibular telehealth world. Like what is, how do you, how is in-person vestibular visit different than a telehealth vestibular visit? So going back to the previous slide, in-person telehealth, in-person vestibular visit, usually we have the we talk to the patient for 25 minutes, we do evaluations and that we might do detailed evaluation of oculomotor exam, we might use VR goggles, balance testing, gait exam, um, and then assessment and planning would be 10 to 15 um, minute like treatment and education. What happens in a telehealth visit? You, you definitely, you know, there is an intro and a greeting period. And most important thing we do or we recommend is having an emergency response plan and a consent that patient agrees to be seen. By emergency response plan here is that we, you know, get their information in case we have to generate an emergency response. We can call the emergency team and have them help out in case needed. Never needed so far, but in case you always want to have that information with you. And then go into a flags screening, which I'm coming to, detailed vestibular history, along with goal setting. Our objective portion is a little bit less where we do detailed oculomotor exam, we do BPPV, balance and gait testing, and then assessment and planning remains the same. Coming to screening for red flags, yellow flags, orange flags, blue flags, there's so many colors. Um, what is important to understand that we definitely are trained to screen for red flags, but it's also important to understand what are yellow flags and the other colors. So I'll start with the yellow flag. Yellow flag is important to identify, identify presence of fear of movement, injury, falls, any catastrophizing of symptoms, you want to make sure you're seeing your patient on a holistic approach, as well as, you know, understanding and screening them from biopsychosocial model. With com when it comes to orange flags, it's important to screen them for any 
psychological conditions like anxiety, depression. Due to this, because dizziness and vertigo can affect somebody's quality of life and um, it can have comorbidity, psychiatric comorbidities that you should be screening your patients for. And then at the end, blue flags. You want to identify how much of this has affected that person's um, or increased their fear of resuming back to work, if they have low job satisfaction to begin with, um, if they have a stressful work environment, that will predict how your patient's responding. So, uh, and this has been proven in the MSK musculoskeletal world on how patients respond to pain and that does not change for dizziness. Deep dive into a red flag. So if you have any of these, um, if you see your patients having any of these, I would say refer this patient out immediately to emergency or the nearest hospital system. And then once uh, they have been seen for emergency, um, there are next layers of referrals that you would you want to see uh, have the patient. So the patient say has a non vestibular cause of dizziness which can be cardiac in origin, it can be gastric in or origin, uh, it could be ne other neurologic conditions like central vestibular disorders. You want them to see PCP, neurologists, cardiologists. So we have developed like this triage chart for you all to kind of take a look at as some kind of guiding point when you're doing this by yourself remotely. All right, indications. Who is, who, which patients after doing a telehealth evaluation, you would prefer an in-person follow-up? A person who is at high fall risk without a caregiver. Your patient's safety is your top priority. And hence, it's very important uh, to make sure that if there is no caregiver and you think they are going to be at fall risk or very high fall risk, you would recommend in-person follow-up. Patients with cognitive impairments who have difficulty understanding instructions through the telehealth platform. Patients who are highly anxious, fearful, or emotional. Um, and I it, vertigo can be very scary. And if, in that population, uh, in-person visit is more preferred. Anybody with a hearing loss without a hearing aid or an amplifier, that will make it really hard. And if you had somebody with upper cervical instability, where you wanna, you suspect, you know, injury to the ligaments of C-spine, you really want to see them in person. Um, and patients who really are also like are highly complex based on personal factors. And I wanna say those are the flags. They're not stable clinically and it's just hard to see them remotely. So I would recommend um, for, those personal factors to see them in person. Who would be not appropriate? And then we know this is not a perfect world. Uh, we want some, you know, there, there has to be some kind of exclusion criteria for vestibular telehealth. Um, and I would say, yes, non-vestibular causes of dizziness, which is basically cardiac origin or something else. Medical contraindication for necessary head movements, right? If they had like, a surgery in their C-spine and they are not allowed to move their heads, it will be really hard because they might not have a head down table. It might be hard to do an evaluation. So for their safety, we would exclude them. Same thing with cognitive impairment, language barrier, hardware, software issues. If there's no caregiver and high fear and anxiety, and most important, if they're not getting better remotely, please don't see them remotely. They have to respond. So I just listed this, we have oculomotor exam details, videos are in the course. So because I wanted to limit and have more Q&A time, I've, I'm gonna direct you all to the course. How do you prepare for a telehealth visit? You send them a prep email a day before. You, you send them outcome measures that you want them to fill out. Usually we have our patients fill out dizziness, handicap inventory, activities of balance, specific scale, confidence specific scale, um, FABQ questionnaire, we wanna know if they're fearful. Um, 
And then if patient is dizzy and they get this long email and they don't have the stamina to even read it, then give them a video. We have a patient prep video um, that you can just forward to your patient. It's going to be so easy for them to listen to you for two minutes and prepare versus read through an email. Follow guidelines. You want to verify as soon as you turn on, you want to verify the identi identity of the person in front of you. You want to take their consent. And it's amazing. Um, and it's extremely, extremely, extremely important for us to be responsible clinicians and report if you see the domestic abuse or if you see uh, uh, child abuse or any kind of um, safety um, hazard to your patient, you wanna report that and take emergency response information. So a little bit about the course. Again, uh, this is like first ever telehealth course. So we are open to feedback. We have a feedback form after everybody completes that course. The initial set of peer reviewers for this course involved neuroclinical physical therapists, neurocertified clinical physical therapists, and then otolaryngologists from Stanford, primary care physicians from One Medical, and PTs within Agile. So everybody came together to actually critique the course and improve it even further. This course is approved by CPTA, um, California Board of Physical Therapy Association, to give 0.8 CEU towards your um, license renewal. And the best thing is no prerequisites required. If anybody's interested, we are also offering one-on-one -on -one mentoring sessions. A uh, couple of them are available through our mentors post-course. A physical therapist who has completed this course should be able to conduct a detailed virtual visit for vestibular patients and then evaluate acute vertigo, concussion, BPPV, cervicogenic dizziness, and fall risk all virtually. Um, as a gratitude towards Sancheti, I wanted to offer a 10% off uh, to this course. Um, please put in this code. Uh, it's effective until April 30th. And as soon as you click on this link, it will take you to this course. Again, we've had this course published at VEDA as well. And uh, we have all that information here. I have more additional resources, like how does balance system work, anxiety and dizziness. Why see a physiotherapist for dizziness? I get that question a lot. So there's some really nice uh, patient education handouts that I want to share from American Neurophysical Therapy Association. So Kudos to them to make these. All right. And that's about it. Thanks a bunch. And I'm happy to get some questions now. I've spoken for a while. All right. Uh, let me see. How's it going? Yes, Disha. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for uh, your knowledge and sharing your words. Uh, thank you. It's been a privilege to hear you speak on vestibular telehealth and sharing your experiences. Also, thank you for generously sharing your knowledge and time and have enlightened us on the respective topic. Considering the current situation, it is important to know how technology can benefit and not hold a patient from receiving health care. Uh, Ma'am, there are certain questions I'm sure our viewers would like to know more about that. Yeah, go for it. Uh, yeah, ma'am. So, how would you train patients for self-assessment of their conditions and symptoms of vestibular pathology via tele-rehab? Awesome question. Love that. So, there has been like task force articles released in 2021 by the journal Cerebellum, and they're talking about... Um, synchronous evaluation and asynchronous evaluation. Synchronous evaluation is when you are live with your patients. I suppose you were my patient, Disha, and I'm seeing you live and doing a live exam. Much more easy. Then there is asynchronous examination where patients are taking their own video at their convenience and sending it through a secure link to the clinician. Now, both have their advantages and disadvantages. The advantage of a synchronous 
evaluation is you are with the person in front of you so you can you know change and based on their response you can change what you're saying or the angle of the head movement to look at the eye movement whereas asynchronous in which they are taking their own video they have an awesome thing that they all, all of them have this amazing cell phone with them with a very good high quality front facing camera and we recommend um, sending your patient like a prep email or a video or some instructions a day prior so they exactly know what they're supposed to do okay so simple you would tell the patient to have a have them hold their phone in a landscape mode. Most phones have their um, camera at the end. It's not in the center, although we see it in the center, but the camera is at the end. And so you want to make sure you align the nose with the camera and have them move their head and arm together, um, making sure that they can take their video Again, it's a little complicated. You won't get it perfect, but it's convenient for your patient. And ultimately that's important part of your care is how convenient it is, how easy you're making it for the person. Right, ma'am. Absolutely. Ma'am, adding to the question, are there any self-answered questionnaires or scales that patient can uh, send back to you via Google Forms or et cetera? Yes, there is there like very nice uh, validated standardized outcome measures that we have our patients complete prior to seeing them. So dizziness handicap inventory is one. ABC activities of balance specific confidence score. Basically, before even you see the patient, you would know that patient is about 60% confident in their activities of balance specific. So it's kind of nice to then gauge your assessment based on the paperwork. Um, there has been research on like how some components of DHI, if positive, can be 70% sensitive and specific to say it's a cervicogenic dizziness. It's, it's really interesting how they're coming up with like easiest way for diagnosis uh, with a cutoff, of course, and it's not going to be 100%, but 70% with one screening tool is pretty good, I feel. <laughs> Um, so you can get more confirmation, but yes, I recommend using standardized outcome measures so that you also know how your patient is doing at the end of the care you're giving. If they are not improving, they need to be seen in person or referred because it's unfair to them not feel, that they, they are not feeling better. Right, ma'am. Uh, the other question is, ma'am, as we are keeping up with the time and we are switching to tele-rehab, so what do you think about tele-rehab and virtual reality can be combined for better prognosis for patients with vestibular pathology? Yes, the, this virtual reality is the next big thing in the vestibular world. Um, you just need to be knowing as a clinician, again, I want to kind of go back to the clinician inside you, when to use which app. There are a lot of apps out there which are not really great. And there are some apps that are useful. Uh, there are YouTube videos uh, for somebody who's like visually sensitive. There are tons of YouTube videos available for free that you could use through the platform. Um, if patients are sensitive to See how I have like a plain background behind me, but if I had like a complex um, screensaver or a virtual background and I have my patients get used to seeing me, that's rehab for them right away. <laughs> because first barrier is they don't even want to see something that complex. So it's important to desensitize. So you can definitely use that. But again, know when to use what is very critical. Uh, there's a question in the chat. Yes, ma'am. There's one question. So the question is, uh, what's your opinion to use an effectiveness tele rehab in India, especially for vestibular rehab? Uh, can you share some of uh, some more information about tinnitus? Great question. So there are like two questions. I'm going to address the first one. Uh, first, uh, opinion about use and effectiveness of telehealth in India. I think it is very useful. I I'm originally from India. I still have family there who 
gets dizzy and takes Burton forever um, because somebody told them and they forgot to go back to that doctor and ask whether they're supposed to take this or how long. So I would recommend it is much, much needed in India. Um, also, it's the, the structure that we have, 109 lessons, it actually deep dives onto how to do a complete comprehensive evaluation to rule in and rule out every kind of vestibular problem, okay? And sometimes misdiagnosis happens in every country, like this happens everywhere, every patient. Um, so you wanna make sure you do your best diligence as a clinician to study and then apply because patients are gonna get this as a valid complaint. And even little kids have vestibular complaints and vertigo and motion sickness, throwing up in buses, they can't tolerate it. Um, and people are just ignoring it. So I, I think it can be a boon if it's flourishing in India. Uh, and then more about tinnitus. Um, I'm coming to that third one. Uh, more about tinnitus. Let's, so tinnitus can be due to multitude of problems. And uh, if it is due to NAC, then it can be treated through vestibular telehealth. Um, also, um, or in-person vestibular care. But if tinnitus is due to something inside the ear, we would refer that person to a ENT doc. Um, so making sure you know why there is tinnitus is critical. Again, the clinician inside new wants to know when to use what, so it's effective. Uh, what triggers vestibular balance disorders? Great question. <laughs> it's like, you know, that vestibular balance disorders is like a big, big category. Remember I was talking about central, I was talking about peripheral. There are multiple kinds of peripheral. There are multiple kinds of central vestibular problems. And there, are, I just explained BPPV that, you know, the otoconia comes into the semicircular canal. There's bunch in that article. Uh, one is, you know, patients can have vestibular neuritis. The vestibular nerve itself has some kind of inflammation or infection that can lead to an acute vertigo symptoms. There could be a vestibular loss. Suddenly there can be a loss in one side. There could be bilateral loss. There could be loss due to chronic use of medication, you know, autotoxic med medication, basically medications which are toxic to your vestibular system can cause this. So it's asking me what is pathophysiology, <laughs> uh, but I would recommend like that we have tried in that one section to explain in one page, most common vestibular conditions, which can be treated. And I highly recommend you going through that. Um, Preeti asks, can the vestibular system repair itself? Yes, vestib vestibular, everything in our body is thankfully designed by somebody smart <laughs> and uh, they, it, everything heals. Um, you know, we, we can use neuroplasticity uh, to heal central vestibular conditions. And again, the prognosis is different. Um, peripheral, yes, again, it can repair itself to what extent, what are the remaining deficits depends on the cause again. And uh, again, going back to that pathophysiology section. So where we have prognosis of most of the vestibular disorders written. Uh, can anxiety cause vestibular problems? Yes, uh, I wanna say, I don't know about cause and effect relationship, but uh, patients who get like panic attack, for example, they're, what is their number one complaint? Dizziness, that's their number one complaint. Um, and so I don't wanna say that anxiety causes it, but it's a highly correlated, it is common and it is important for us to be aware. And again, listen to your patient, what they're saying. Uh, one of the most important thing we do as clinician is we just jump ahead <laughs> to what's what's the what's our treatment and what's our diagnosis without even listening. So yes, we want to listen, and you want to scan or you want to hear screen your patients for those fears that they have. Uh, what what is limiting them? What is their quality? How is their quality of life affected? And that is very important to identify. 
what happens in patients who have vestibular conditions and they get anxiety on top of that, it takes longer to get better for those people because they have fears associated with it. And it stimulates amygdala, which creates the sense of perceived threat in their system. And so it's really important to ask, screen, and support your person in front of you. And if they need help, like refer them to, it's a team approach. It's a multi uh, multidisciplinary team approach. So refer them for cognitive behavioral therapy, show them how clinically they are getting better. And th those people respond really, really well. Uh, Rohit is asking, is vestibular disease neurological? Great question. I think it is. Um, it's, it is, it is, uh, again, I don't want to call it disease to be, to be uh, protective of my vestibular patients, <laughs> but yes, uh, vestibular complaints are neurological. So I would say yes. Okay. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts on this questions, ma'am. We'll end up with the last question. Uh, so ma'am, during tele rehab, uh, would you suggest the role of family as an important factor for a better uh, treatment session or a supervised treatment session. As we see the symptoms, one of the important symptoms is imbalance, uh, which may lead to fall. So how would you suggest to have a supervised session via tele-rehab? Love that question. And there is no better place than India for family, at least for me, I miss that here. Uh, yeah. But yet I want to say, uh, you know what that first question uh, Jayesh Bhai had asked, uh, what, what's your opinion about effectiveness of telehealth in India? Yes, there's so much support available um, that I would recommend, like, yes, it is much, much easier when you have a caregiver ready to support that patient through what they are going through. And uh, um, that empathy piece works. You want to make sure your patient is supported, but not like overly, like, again, you want that caregiver to be not fear inducing. So like, you know, you want them to support and then you, it's like you're treating the patient, but you're also educating the caregiver on how to treat the patient when you're not there and what to look for in, you know, what to guide the person for. But I love that question. Yes, it, it is important. Being a physical therapist, uh, our role is to, you know, our touch is more important for the patient, but then, for us being not physically present with the patient, family can indulge into the treatment and have that effectiveness with the session and we can guide them. That's a good thing. Thank you, ma'am. It's touch is there. We are educated. Education is such a strong touch yes, uh, that stays with you no matter because physical touch will disconnect education. Yes gets disconnected exactly. so I, I say what you're telling the caregiver what you're telling the person in front of you is so meaningful to them and they look forward to that visit with you which they have waited for so long uh, sometimes patients were traveling far away to see a vestibular therapist whereas telehealth makes it easy for them to see it whenever they want uh, from the comfort of their house and so I think I think uh, Education is huge. Yes, right. Thank you, ma'am. It's been an honor to hear you on this topic. Uh, I would like to uh, thank you for sharing your time and knowledge and all the experiences you have. Uh, I would also like to thank Physio TV for hosting this session and Sajjati Institute to provide us with such a great platform where distance can't hold you back uh, to gain knowledge and sharing a common platform and inculcate this learning into our practice and benefiting patients. I would also like to thank the technical team for supporting us throughout the session. Before signing off, I would like to thank all the viewers for joining us and hope you all continue to learn from this wonderful platform in the coming sessions as well and events. Uh, I hope we all, will, we all will have our experiences and uh, to share and to try to implement this uh, tele rehab in vestibular dysfunction. Thank you for joining us. Hope to see you all in coming sessions and events. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you. And I want to thank Disha for uh, doing a, such a great job moderating this. So kudos, team. <laughs>